So I've reached the end of week three and this week I got my first assignment and that was a presentation on from my reading what do I think cognition is and why do I think the study of it is important and I'm, I'm going to go through that presentation today for the for for all of you and it's largely based on some feedback that I got from last week's video which is that the most interesting things that I talked about were the things that I talked about a little bit more in depth as opposed to just skimming over. So that's what that's the form of that this YouTube channel is going to take going forward in that I'm going to focus on one specific thing from that week and try and expand on it a little bit more. So there'll be the videos will be a little bit shorter than they've been before, but they'll be a bit more focused. So today I'm just going to kind of run through the most interesting parts of this presentation and I'm going to be providing some links into the description to some of the reading that I did and some things that you should explore further if you find anything that I'm talking about particularly interesting. So first of all, I was asked I was asked a question from your reading. What do, what is cognition? What does cognition mean to you? And why do you think the study of it is important? And it was funny. I was I had a serious case of man flu at the time, so I was reading the cog reading the question over and over again and I was like ah uh, what am I gonna how will I start this well from my reading does that include reading that I did before and I couldn't really get my head around it and it was because my cognition had been affected by my illness at the time by the man flu so even that just goes to show that cognition is something that can change depending on your health or depending on how much you slept we all know what it feels like when cognition is affected, when we don't have the brain power for a certain task. And I'm going to go back to that a bit later. So anyway, I got over my man flu, my cognition went back up and I was able to properly prepare for the presentation and figure out from what angle I was going to take it and how best to deliver it. So from my undergraduate, degree I studied neuroscience and we would have looked at cognition for a lot of my learning there. We would have looked at different diseases of the nervous system which affect cognition for instance Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease and also Huntington's disease. So we would have tried to look at different ways which these cognition deficits can be alleviated and perhaps even looking at some of the different brain regions that are involved in cognition which might be changed because of those diseases so already I'm getting an idea of well cognition is maybe an emerging process from the brain in the sense that if we damage the brain well cognition is going to be affected and I also understand that cognition is something that is modifiable by drugs so we would have looked at different drugs which affect cognition perhaps even improving it and these drugs are called nootropics. Um, we looked at a specific class of nootropics which are called ampokines, which work on the AMPA receptor. But that's a very, very neuroscientific approach, looking at the receptors, seeing how the response, the responses change when you activate these receptors at different levels, trying to measure different effects downstream from that in terms of cognition. So it was very, very analytical, very neuroscientific. Um, Whereas more recently, I've been kind of listening to a lot of different podcasts from the perspective of computer scientists, philosophers and psychologists, which has given me kind of a, a more well-rounded idea of cognition and what it might mean to human and animal species. And now, presently, I'm reading a lot of psychology specific material in relation to the masters so for instance i've been reading a, a textbook on cognition by isaac and keen called cognitive psychology it's given me a great insight into the approaches to studying cognition today and the differences between them and the limitations and how, how we how we view cognition yeah today so first things first i'd like to tell you who's considered the father of cognitive science and his name is Ulrich Neisser. So he was the first person to kind of give a, a, a definition of cognition which I'd, I'd like to read to you now because I think it's a great intro into cognition and to me it's probably the best and shortest definition I can find. So Ulrich Neisser said that cognition refers to all processes by which the sensory input is transformed, reduced, elaborated, 
stored, recovered and used. It is concerned with these processes even when they operate in the absence of relevant stimulation. So that quote shows us that cognition is the processes by which sensory input, i.e. information, is processed by the, by the body, including obviously the central nervous system, particularly the brain. And with that in mind, it just goes to show how many different processes that cognition is involved in. So we have learning, memory, attention, perception, problem solving, reasoning, thinking, to, just to name a few. I'm going to refer back to these later on when I discuss why I think studying, studying cognition is so important. So first of all, let's take the four different approaches to studying cognition. They include cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience, cognitive neuropsychology, and cognitive computer science. Those are the four main perspectives on cognitive on cognition today. And it's from these perspectives that different people study cognition and they use different methodologies. So these are very, very, very distinct areas. And already considering the diversity of approach to studying cognition, you can see why cognition might be difficult to define and difficult to find an agreed upon definition which everybody would accept. So what cognition means to me is very different to what cognition might mean to a computational scientist, for instance, who's looking at cognition from that perspective. So with that in mind, I just I give you an insight into some of the limitations of studying cognition. So two approaches, for instance, from the psychological perspective, we have the behavioral approach. And from the neuroscientific perspective, we have the neuroimaging approach. So there are limitations to both these approaches and it'll further give you insight into why cognition is so complex. So we might have somebody uh, investigating the behavior of somebody and are, do they have a higher cognition than somebody else? So with that in mind, we're only looking at their behaviors, maybe their performance in an uh, implicit association test or their performance in a Stroop test, for instance. I mentioned these in previous videos and if you don't know what they are, I recommend you look at the previous videos. So when we look at the performance on these tests, we're getting an idea of cognition and how that affects our behavior. But we don't really know what the underlying mechanisms of this behavior are. So what parts of the brain are being activated? How, how, are, we, how are we engaging this behavior? What's happening underneath the surface? And neuroimaging can give us an insight into that. But neuroimaging has its limitations as well because perhaps we conduct these tasks on a person who's in a fMRI machine, a, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. And this machine gives us an idea of what parts of the brain are active during a specific time point. So we might ask them a question and then we might infer oh, we can see activation in this part of the brain, that means it must be implicated in this cognitive task. But we can't be sure because we don't know if that person, you know, got an itch in their foot at the same time, if they're thinking about past experiences, if it's actually nothing got to do with the cognitive task, but it has more to do with their boredom or the sound of the voice, maybe that's the reason why that part of the brain is being activated. Maybe it reminded them of somebody else. Maybe they're getting frustrated because the question is being asked too slowly or too fast or in such a way that they like or dislike. So we cannot really make proper inferences about the information we get from these neuroimaging studies and apply them to what we see in the behavior. So it's very, very complex to study. And an analogy I found helpful was that of looking at, let's say, a web page and the underlying computer code which displays that web page. Take the Google homepage, for example. We have some hyperlinks in the top. We have the Google logo in the middle. Underneath is the search box and we have some uh, language options at the bottom, I think it is. So if we look at the computer code which underlies this, most of us don't really know about computer code. So we have no idea what the web page will look like just by looking at the computer code. It's very, very difficult to know. We don't know what's showing the logo, 
what's showing the search box, how is this being presented. And if we compare the two of them together, they're so abstract, we don't really know what's going on. And that's kind of similar to neuroimaging and behavior. When we're looking at neuroimaging data, we can't really make inferences about what the behavior looks like. And when we're looking at behavior, we can't really make inferences about what the neuroimaging looks like. Now, I know the analogy isn't great because we have experts in computer scientists and in computer science and in user interfaces who will be able to make these connections. But we haven't been able to get to that point with neuroimaging and behavior studies yet. So a lot of the knowledge is kind of out there to be grasped and we haven't yet grasped it, which just is one example of why it's so important to study cognition. There's so much to be learned. I mentioned the four different perspectives on studying cognition today and there are numerous even subdivisions into those perspectives from which people specialize in. So the, the difficulty to, def to find an accepted definition of cognition was really crystallized recently in an article published in Current Biology, which as part of my presentation I read. And we have perception experts, we have computer science experts, we have uh, neurological experts, all given their perspective on cognition. And they're very diverse and they're very obscure and, and quite esoteric to each specific discipline. But one thing that I found kind of was coming through all, a lot of their definitions was that they, they seem to have cognition, uh, they seem to want to define cognition in terms of human ability, something that humans have, and they don't really want to assign it to other animals. I didn't really understand this myself because I see we're very similar to many animals. Obviously, we're maybe more complex, we're able to complete more difficult tasks, but all in all, you know, we have similar organ systems, we have a similar makeup in terms of maybe keratin in our nails and our hair, we have similar skin, we have a similar you know, numbers of limbs and stuff, you know, so I, I'm not as reluctant as some of the different experts in this paper to assign cognition to other animals. Now, I'm no expert, so perhaps their opinion is more valuable than mine, but I'd like to just discuss my perspective a little bit further. The definitions that the experts gave seem to also entangle cognition with consciousness. So f to give you an example, the perception expert, well he said that cognition is everything but perception. I find that unusual. And another expert said that cognition is the ability to use models. And again, I thought that that kind of implied consciousness as well. To me, a model, like a, an idea of something, is, is a narrative thing, it's, it's like a descriptive thing, it's kind of something that we say in our minds or it's a construct in our minds which we can talk about. To me that's consciousness and I tried my best for my own sake to disentangle co cognition with consciousness and the way I did that, perhaps incorrectly, I'd, I'd encourage you to do some of your own research, your own learning, but the way I did it was thinking that consciousness is something that has narrative whereas cognition is something that has power. So with that, they're often complementary. You know, cognition can inform our consciousness and consciousness can inform our cognition, but I think we can have one and not the other. So when we're thinking of consciousness and particularly human level consciousness, yes, that's something that's particular and peculiar to human beings and we're not gonna assign, and we, I don't think we should assign human level consciousness to other animals. But we can assign different levels or different gradations of cognition. You know, we have a great cognitive ability to achieve and complete very complex tasks, whereas other animals can't. That's not to say they don't have cognition, but perhaps they might have less cognitive power than we have. And another way I tried to define cognition was by means of organic information processing, which comes back to what Ulrich Neisser said about the ability to process sensory input. So I think that cognition can be defined in those terms as organic, so uh, life, you know, carbon-based life forms, processing information. To me, that's cognition. And you could even go as far as to say, well then plants have an element of cognition, bacteria have an element of cognition. 
which is very, very controversial. A lot of different cognitive scientists, they do not want to assign cognition to lower animals. They, they consider that learning associative learning, which uh, reflects on a lot of the ideas of B.F. Skinner and behaviorism and a lot of Pavlovian conditioning. That would be an example of associative learning where you have kind of a, a stimulus response. But to, to get that response, I understand that, that there's organic information processing going on. There's cognitive power. You're receiving information. You're resolving that information in such a way as to behave in a particular way. So to me, that's cognition. I don't see why we shouldn't consider it as cognition. But if you look at some of the links in the description, there'll be a lot of elaborate reasons as to why associated learning isn't cognition. I don't want to get into that right now because personally, I don't find it particularly interesting. I refer to cognition as something as as something that has power. This is not a new idea. We talk about it in everyday language. We say brain power. Oh, look, man, I don't have the brain power to do that at the moment. Or, geez, I, I had a terrible sleep last night. I don't have the brain power for this task at the moment, for this homework. Or I don't have the brain power to make dinner. We'll get, we'll, we'll get a takeaway. You know, these are examples, everyday examples of how we talk about cognition. We all know what cognition is. We all know when it's effective. And that's why I think it shouldn't be so difficult to, de to define. Yes, maybe it should be difficult to study, you know, because of all of the complexities that I referred to earlier. But we all know from an experiential level what cognition is and what it feels like. So I think I don't see why it should be difficult to define. But look, that's up for debate massively. So in summary, my perspective on cognition and what it means to me is that it's different to consciousness. Consciousness has narrative, cognition doesn't, it has power. It's very difficult to study because of its complexities and because of the differences between behavior and neuroimaging and just the complexities of the, the human brain and even the brain of other species. But although it's difficult to study, it should be difficult to define. And when I made the presentation this week, the, my lecturer did not agree at all. He thinks it should be difficult to define. And my opinion is very subjective on that. And he also agreed that he, he, his perspective on it is quite subjective too, but he had a visceral response to me saying it should be difficult to define. He really didn't think it should. So that's worth considering too. And then when we're thinking about why is it important to study? Well, I mentioned how cognition is implicated in learning, memory, at attention, problem solving, perception, and reasoning and thinking. Basically, everything we care about. So if we're to learn more about everything we care about, we need to understand cognition better. And take learning, for instance. If we learn more about cognition, we learn more about learning. We can improve our pedagogy the way we teach people. We can improve the way we learn. We can improve our entire education system. This master's is very difficult for me to complete. It's going to be one year of intense study and intense research. But maybe if we knew more about cognition, it would be a breeze. Maybe I could do two masters in half the time. If I was able to enhance my cognition some way, perhaps through drugs or through different practices, or Perhaps there could be different teaching methods which could enable me to learn more effectively. But with the current understanding of cognition, it's going to be a difficult year, but it'll be worth it. I know that much. So education, one big example of why cognition is important to study. I'm going to give two more examples. Morality and ethics. If we know more about cognition, we can inform our morality and our ethics and how we treat each other and other animals and other species, even plants. Because, for instance, if we discover that cows have incredibly high cognitive levels, way beyond what we thought of, beyond even ourselves, we might be reluctant to continue farming and slaughtering them as we do. On the other hand, if we find out that they actually have less cognitive power than we ha than we thought they did, we might be more inclined to say, oh, maybe it's okay to farm cows at this level, or maybe we don't need to give them so much space, or maybe they don't need too much care. You know, so 
it's going to inform our morality and our ethical approach to things like farming or even how we treat uh, different people in our pop in our in our environment you know if we're not at present perhaps we might misunderstand different organisms capacities and if we learn their capacities are greater well then we might treat them better and if we learn their capacities are less great well then we might treat them differently so it's very very interesting to consider cognition research in morality and ethics perhaps the most topical the most topical area in which cognition research can be applied is an artificial intelligence and applying it to a problem which is referred to as the alignment problem so we're living in an age where technology is growing and growing and growing in complexity and it's likely that we're going to reach a point where we will have computers that are more capable than human brains at accomplishing different tasks, at learning across the board. Now, we already have this with, with, with calculators. We've had calculators for years that have been able to do, uh, that have been able to do arithmetic that, hu that very few humans can do. But we're, reach we're going to reach a stage where computers are better at every cognitive task. And they're going to accelerate in their abilities far greater than we can. People are getting smarter, smarter, and people are getting more cognitively uh, proficient. But there's going to reach a point where computers will improve at a rate far greater than we can. I think that by understanding cognition better and organic information processing the way we do, we can maybe have our computer technologies cognize in a way that's more similar to us and that will align that will mean that the computers will align more with our values and more with our modes of thinking so for instance if we got a very capable artificial intelligence and we instructed it to get rid of cancer get rid of human cancer we want we want cancer in humans gone well one way to effectively complete that task is to murder everybody. And that's because, and a computer might do that happily because it isn't aligned with our values. We gave it an instruction and it completed the instruction. Now, if we had that same computer cognize more like humans, so think more like humans and conceptualize ideas more like humans, well then, it's probably not going to kill everybody. It's going to find a different way to solve the human cancer problem. We want our technologies, we want our computers to think more like us, so that even when they start advancing to a greater degree than us, well, it's going to be like how we would advance if we had those capacities. So, I'd like to summarise what I've been telling you about cognition now with a great quote, actually, from my colleague who presented on cognition after me. And he said that cognition is simple phenomenologically but complex neurobiologically breaking that quote down from a phenomenological perspective from the perspective of experience it's very simple to understand bad night's sleep cognition's affected great run cognition's improved but it's very complex neurobiologically so from the neuroscientific perspective, from the neuroimaging perspective, when we're looking at different CAT scans, fMRI scans, EEG scans, these are very, very difficult to interpret. It's very hard to really understand what's going on on the level of the brain from the neurobiological perspective, what is happening. So I thought that crystallized my, my approach and my ideas very well. I hope you found the very. I hope you found cognition very interesting. If you find particular parts specifically quite interesting, I'd encourage you to search more. Make sure to follow my Instagram page as well, where I'm going to be sharing more little tidbits along the way and different photos. And also, I'd like you to like if you like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't. If you haven't subscribed already and you like the channel, make sure you subscribe so you see my next video. And until the end of week four, thanks very much for listening and watching.